So part two of our PowerPoint unit 1.3 on microbial phenomenon. Um, so we're going to start with slide 26. Yeah. So the, the recurring topic that um, we've presented in earlier PowerPoints is biological evolution and natural selection. This is a foundation concept in biology. So again, we want to ask, you know, well, what is biological evolution, natural selection? Why do we care? So one definition of biological evolution is a change in the genetic makeup of a population of organisms or agents over time. And we might ask, how, how does this happen? So one mechanism that drives biological evolution is natural selection. And in natural selection, the environment selects which variants in a population are best adapted to survive in that environment. Those organisms have better survival, they have more offspring, and their, their specific group of genes then is passed on to their offspring. And over time then, this will change the genetic makeup of that population of organisms, and the result will be they'll be better adapted to an ever-changing environment. So it's important for us to recognize that genetic diversity, diversity is essential for populations of organisms to survive because our environment is constantly changing. So diversity is crucial for our survival. Um, and we will see later that sometimes human activities can change, or excuse me, human activities can change which genetic variants in a population will be selected. And so we're going to discover that, unfortunately, humans have influenced natural selection and have influenced biological evolution, often with harmful results. And we'll see later that the example we'll be using is the evolution of drug-resistant um, microbial pathogens. So here is um, a little example of how human activities can influence natural selection, thus biological evolution. This is the overuse, the inappropriate use of antibiotics. Now, antibiotics should be used to treat bacterial pathogens. However, if they're overused, or for example, if they're added to animal feeds to um, increase weight gain or milk production or egg production, what will happen is that in a normal population of microbes, say in the intestinal tract of the, of the food animal, through natural um, spontaneous mutations within a population of microbes in the intestine, most of the microbes here in purple would be um, sensitive or killed by the antibiotic. But through this spontaneous mutations, there might be you know one or two members that are naturally resistant. So if we humans change the environment by saturating it with, by saturating the environment, the intestinal environment, say with antibiotics, the sensitive bacteria are killed, and who's going to survive? Um, only that resistant bacterium. Now the resistant bacterium normally um, would not grow at a rapid rate because they're competing with all their um, neighbors, competing for food, competing for space. Uh, metabolic waste products can inhibit the growth of these antibiotic resistant bacteria. But once all the neighbors are killed, and we only have our little resistant guy surviving, now they have no competition. They can start growing and dividing like crazy, passing on their antibiotic resistance genes. And thus, over time, with a lot of antibiotics in our environment, say in the intestinal tract, we have a genetic change in the population of intestinal bacteria. Now, instead of being mostly antibiotic sensitive, now we have a population of bacteria that are all antibiotic resistant. So again, we see how human activities can influence natural selection and can actually drive the evolution of antibiotic resistant bacterial pathogens. So often when we talk about these topics in microbiology, it's sometimes you know we feel kind of discouraged or defeated, um, but we shouldn't because if we can understand how these processes work, we can we can find strategies to reverse these processes, reverse reverse the activities that um, select for these antibiotic resistant bacterial pathogens. So one strategy that we are applying now as humans is we're trying to reduce the um, inappropriate use of antimicrobial drugs, for example, reducing the use of antibiotics. And a big place um, where, where we can have 
big impact in reducing antibiotics is the use of antibiotics in agriculture, specifically when we're um, talking about food animals, um, animals that we might use for meat or poultry or eggs or milk. So at one time in the United States, I was horrified to learn that 70% of the antibiotics we used in the United States were used as feed additives. And feed additives are um, substances added to animal feeds that will help them gain weight more rapidly, make more milk, make more eggs per pound of feed. And feed additives, these aren't, these aren't um, being used to treat an actual infection. Again, they're, they're to increase weight gain, milk production, and egg production. But if these antibiotics are constantly present in the animal feeds, that means we're changing the environment of the intestinal tract, and thus we're going to be selecting for these antibiotic-resistant um, bacterial pathogens. And these pathogens can be passed on to humans, or the antibiotic resistance genes can be passed to human microbes. So one big concern uh, for the overuse of antibiotics in agriculture is we'll be talking a lot about uh, fecal-oral transmission of bacterial pathogens. And and it is disturbing, but when animals are slaughtered, um, very often they're going into fight or flight, and they lose control of their bowels. So in the, the slaughterhouse, uh, the processing plants, there can be a lot of feces present. And in the feces can be the antibiotic-resistant bacteria. So if the feces contaminates um, our foods, or let's say a food, maybe fecal contaminated food, it isn't um, cooked properly, or maybe um, fecal contamination of our salad greens occurs and we consume, we consume those fecal contaminated um, uh, uh, products, then we can become colonized with those antibiotic resistant bacteria, which may be pathogens themselves, or the antibiotic resistant bacteria can pass the antibiotic resistance genes to members of our intestinal microbiome. And then we have a reservoir of these antibiotic resistance genes, which can subsequently be passed to um, other human bacterial pathogens. So just backing up here. So it is really, really encouraging. Um, there are big efforts. Um, underway to reduce the use of antibiotics in animal feeds. And again, this might be another great topic for an extra credit poster if any of you are interested. This is a really exciting topic, the topic of microbial bioremediation. This is when we use microbes to detoxify pollutants or toxins. Um, and microbes have an incredible capacity to metabolize all different kinds of, of compounds, including toxins and pollutants. A really exciting topic is development of microbial bioreactors. You might think of a, bio, a microbial bioreactor just as a container that contains microbes that are going to be used to detoxify, break down toxins or pollutants. Um, a wonderful example of microbial bioreactor is um, down at CSU Monterey Bay. Um, they're using microbial bioreactors to treat agricultural water runoff. Now, um, agricultural water runoff from the fields can contain pesticides, herbicides. Um, they might contain fertilizers. Um, for example, the, the runoff might contain a high level of nitrates, which we know can contribute to harmful algal blooms. And we also know that in that runoff water, the pesticides um, and fertilizers can contaminate uh, natural um, aquatic systems in our creeks and rivers and along the coasts and could also potentially contaminate human drinking water. So a wonderful example of how these um, microbial bioreactors can be used um, in a beneficial way is that they can help reduce the occurrence of harmful algal blooms in rivers and lakes and along our coastal waters. So harmful algal blooms is when there's a rapid uncontrolled growth of of um, organisms called algae or cyanobacteria. And the, the danger is, there's a couple of dangers here. Some of these algae or cyanobacteria, they produce toxins. And these toxins can harm humans that come in contact. They can, they can uh, uh, the toxins can harm mammals and birds and fish when the toxins are ingested. And then uh, another danger is if we have a big overgrowth of algae or cyanobacteria, eventually they die, 
and then bacteria, other bacteria, in the process of degrading the dead algae and cyanobacteria will consume all the oxygen that's present in the water. So um, as it says here, after these blooms, this overgrowth of the algae and cyanobacteria, after the bloom dies, the microbes which decompose the dead algae use up even more of the oxygen which create fish die off. So we end up with these areas called dead zones where there's no oxygen present at all. We're, um, we have a, a lack of um, birds, animals, mammals, fish, um, shellfish in these areas. And we see along our, the, um, our coastal waters here in North America, these are huge issues with these harmful algal blooms um, caused a lot by um, the, the coastal waters becoming contaminated with nitrates and, and phosphates often associated with fertilizers or maybe human and animal waste that gets washed in to the coastal waters. And again, what we can do is if we can run that water through these microbial bioreactors, we can get rid of, definitely we can get rid of the nitrates, um, then that might help reduce these harmful algal blooms. So we, we use one group of microbes to, one group of beneficial microbes to treat a problem caused by a potentially harmful group of um, microbes. So these are just some photos here along um, algal blooms along um, the west coast in the Gulf of California. So we could use some microbial bioreactors down there, certainly. Um, and we, another topic that, again, maybe folks might be interested in extra credit po poster is to look at the contr contribution of microbes to global climate change. And again, there could be the good microbes and the bad microbes. Are there some microbes that are contributing to changes in our climate, are there other microbes that perhaps could help reduce some of these changes that we're seeing in our climate? So again and again, as you'll hear throughout the semester, we are definitely living on the planet of the microbes. So um, what we'll do is we'll hope to have again some audio recordings of the final PowerPoint in Lecture Unit 1, and that would be our unit um, Unit 1.4, A Short History of Microbiology, where we'll talk about just a few of the folks that have had an impact in the development of microbiology.